brilliant start. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming for the third day of the conference. Um, I'm going to be chairing this morning. Uh, my name is uh, Jamie Turner. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering here at KAUST, for those who don't know me. Uh, my area of specialization is engines, um, so I'm not a particularly good match to uh, chairing this session. So I would say um, I'm sure we've got a lot of really interesting stuff to be presented this morning. Uh, I'm looking to you guys to ask the questions because I'm not going to understand much of it at all. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, she is Heather Allen from Ohio State University. Uh, she's a full professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry and in the Department of Pathology. Uh, her research specializes in spectroscopic instrumentation, sensing methodology, molecular organization, iron pairing, and hydration at aqueous interfaces with applications ranging from atmospheric and ocean surface chemistry to biophysics of the lung. She received her BS and PhD degrees in chemistry at the University of California in Irvine, and she's recently awarded the 2022 Chem American Chemical Society's Irv Irving Langmuir Award in Chemical Physics for her seminal contributions towards the understanding of liquid surfaces. And just before you start, um, she will be assisted uh, in, in her presentation by Nicole North as well. Okay, thank you. So thank you for the introduction. I've had a wonderful time and um, really appreciated the hospitality. So I'm going to talk about molecular spectroscopic sensing development uh, with machine learning. And again, I'm Heather Allen, and I'll introduce Nicole about halfway through. So I want to start by telling you where Ohio is. <laughs> a lot of you have not been to Ohio, probably. It's actually considered the Midwest, but you see it's very east. It's the easternmost state of the Midwest. Uh, I was raised in California, and I didn't realize until 20 years ago till I moved there how east it was. So uh, Ohio State's a quite large university. We have nearly 70,000 students. So chemistry alone teaches close to 10,000 general chemistry students every year in the classrooms. It's quite a large program. Uh, the chemistry program is number 19 overall and 10 in public universities. Okay, so I first started being interested in machine learning back in 2009 when I did a sabbatical leave in the Department of Pathology. And we actually started to look at infrared spectra, particularly Raman spectra, actually at first of different tissues in, in the morgue. We had a lab next to the morgue. And um, this has translated years later into a startup company, IR MedTech. I'm not going to be talking about this work, but um, I'm actually going to switch gears now and tell you what most of our research is on or motivated by. So my background is chem chemistry, obviously physical chemistry, uh, chemical physics, but motivation and quite a lot of atmospheric chemistry background. And so we, when I think about atmospheric chemistry, I think about atmospheric aerosols, I think about climate change, the connection to energy, of course, is sustainability and trying to understand our atmosphere. I've been particularly interested in oceans and ocean surfaces and the chemistry and composition of ocean surfaces. And we use these for really proxy systems for our, or, or the basis for proxy systems in our laboratory. So I think a lot about, in our lab, things quite a lot about atmospheric aerosol. And of course, from the marine aerosol, it emanates from wave and wind action uh, from the ocean surface. And the ocean surface itself is, is quite complex and quite different than the bulk seawater. There is aggregation of organics and also aggregation of uh, more ions. Certain ions are, are more prevalent in that sea surface microlayer and then are more prevalent in our aerosol. So the marine aerosol, or, um, liquid particulate matter changes a lot through the atmosphere. It, many of these particles, many of these aerosols become cloud condensation nuclei and they play a role in, in climate change and just in our climate, right? Our natural inherent climate. Okay, this is the motivation. We look at simple systems typically and these systems, um, again, the interest is in aqueous and liquid surfaces. So all of our technology that we utilize to investigate liquid surfaces is specific to that. So I just wanted to give an overview. In fact, the first 10 minutes is going to be an overview, and then I'm going to hand it over for Nicole for, for her project and, and another student's project in machine learning. So on the top left is surface potential. And in the surface potential, we measure inherent electric fields emanating from the air-water interface. So every surface has a, an electric field that emanates from the surface potential. Neat water without any ions is relatively low, but it, 
It is inherent there, and of course every solution is different, and that inherent electric field tells us about the, the, field, the fields within right, the very surface region and the segregation essentially of ions. So across the top row, we, we study or we utilize Langmuir isotherms for organic films. And in the top right, we do quite a bit of imaging, uh, imaging with Brewster angle imaging of the structures in the two-dimensional layers, uh, as well as three-dimensional aggregation. In the bottom row, you see vibrational spectroscopy. So we're, we're quite well known for vibrational spectroscopy and surface selective techniques. So over the last 15 years, I'd say we've been doing quite a lot of infrared, uh, infrared reflection spectroscopy, and this is usually with our films. And then on the bottom right, you see some frequency generation. This is a nonlinear optical tool, so it's a second order response. We use ultrafast lasers, combine them at the liquid surface, reflect off. And this is an interfacially selective technique, although the depth depends on where there's lack of inversion. So it's rather complicated, but it's very high signal to noise typically, and gives you beautiful information about water structure, and again, indirectly about ions, and then also organizational information. So I'm next going to tell you a little bit about four, I'm just gonna give you a glimpse of four example projects that we do in our lab and how this then leads to the machine learning. <coughs> Again, these are all proxy systems. So our, our goal is really to learn more about the ocean surface, so, so understanding really uh, the basics of starting from really liquid, liquid surfaces and ions and neat water. So this was a study, or is an ongoing study actually, in collaboration with theorist Adam Willard out of MIT. Uh, so this is second harmonic generation, also a nonlinear optical technique, and you see in the top left just the, the schematic of what the experiment is. It's looking at the air-water interface, and here we're actually applying an electric field across the air-water gap. And we're doing this to see the inherent response of the surface molecules. Uh, maybe I should remove the inherent, the response from the surface molecules. So we apply quite large fields, but there's a gap of a few millimeters, um, and the, the, it's not electrochemistry. We've actually got the, the plate in the solution grounded. So I have to be careful. My students have to be very careful with this experiment. And you see in the second harmonic that on the left-hand side is the graph of the response of the, the, the photons. We get quite high response at negative electric fields at 5,000 kilovolts. And then we, we come across and across zero, and at 2,800 volts, we get a minimum. And that minimum is not at zero, and that's the main thing that I want to point out to you. And the fact that it's not at zero tells us about the zero volts or the non-biased volts. It tells us that at neat water, there's inherent organization, and it turns out that this very, very small concentrations of OH minus and H3O plus from the autohydrolysis of water have actually, are, are setting up an internal field. And that internal field causes organization and alignment of water molecules without any bias. So your glass of water, if you have a glass of water in front of you, right, that surface potential, it's actually being set up from the inherent autohydrolysis of water, even though the pH is neutral. So, so that was applying electric fields to our water interfaces. Here is an example of recent work by Tessina Dell where we, we took um, a, a measured surface potential of salt electrolyte solutions. And I just want to point out on the far right is a graph with three different plots, sodium chloride electrolyte concentration, sodium bromide, and sodium iodide. And what we can pull from these Langmuir-like adsorption uh, uh, curves, again, this is the far right plot, is that the iodide, the sodium iodide solution, is the highest and has the highest delta G. And so it has the iodide itself is more adsorbed to the surface than bromide and chloride. And so sodium chloride, sodium bromide, sodium iodide, the anion is always adsorbed more closely to the surface, not necessarily on the surface, more closely to the surface, and the sodium is more subsurface. So again, you, you set up a field within those surface layers. So my third example is really many examples, but in early days we used uh, some frequency generation and phase sensitive subfrequency, that's the data below, and the schematics are really the overview of what's happening. And if I just point out to the, the uh, far right in the magnesium sulfate and the magnesium nitrate example, and just look at the arrows, we've got electric fields or you know, opposite from surface potential, 
But the sulfate on the left-hand panel of that right-hand uh, schematic shows sulfate distributions, it's a cartoon, uh, below magnesium. But for nitrate, nitrate, and we get this from our, our phase-sensitive data, nitrate is actually the distribution of nitrate anions is more surface active than magnesium. So you have an opposing field with solutions and electrolytes of magnesium sulfate versus magnesium nitrate. Sulfate is very unique, and you can, you can imagine with atmospheric chemistry and thinking forward a little bit about all the salts and electrolytes in clouds and cloud water, even dilute, they set up fields, and thundercloud electrification is impacted by these things. Okay, the last example I just wanted to mention to you because we're going to be talking about infrared and Raman spectroscopy uh, through Nicole here in a moment. And on the upper left is just the schematic of if we have a film this, in this study, we took infrared reflection, interrogated the surface, but then using a simpler system, looking at Raman at the bulk, just to understand binding, binding of magnesium versus calcium. There's a controversy in the literature about how magnesium is hydrated, how it actually binds to these um, head groups or binds to other maybe acetates. And um, in the end, just to, to, to make a quick point, magnesium does stay completely hydrated to a carboxylic acid head group or car carboxylate compared to calcium, even though calcium's a very, and calcium's a very strong binder, obviously, but so is magnesium. So all of this, and I mentioned before that we're interested in really uh, in, in applying, and we do, a lot of our data is, is utilized in climate models and thought about to provoke certain kinds of questions with thundercloud electrification. But a new direction was we wanted to understand more about the complex system. So we strive to identify the chemical complexity of ocean worlds. I say ocean worlds because beyond the Earth um, and other, for example, Enceladus, and aerosol emissions from the ocean surface. So, so we think the answer is molecular spectroscopy with AI. So real quickly, before I hand it over to Nicole, uh, two more slides. The, just to emphasize the organic enrich enrichment and ion enrichment because of binding in the interfacial layer, or actually the sea surface microlayer, so it is microns thick, but the very nano layer also is unique itself too. So we have degradation of, um, of biological matter, right? We've also got inorganic chemistry going on as well. So a lot of things going on that's very dynamic. And depending on, for example, phytoplankton blooms, where we are in the world, things change. But it's very enriched and different environment at the surface. So this leads to our AI goal. That's, again, to use simple and accessible molecular spectroscopy methods to attain complex answers. Certainly, there's a lot going on across the world with measurement, taking back samples, and doing really high-level high level analyses. But our ideas are to take simple Raman, portable Raman, and infrared spectroscopies, as well as low-cost, low-resolution mass spectrometry to get out, uh, get out details so we can actually do a better job of proxy, but also add to the field. So with that, I'm going to introduce my student, Nicole North. I think several of you have met her through the poster session. And she's uh, Nicole's a senior-level student. She's a NASA fellow, actually a future investigator. She's been funded through her whole time at Ohio State through the NASA program. And actually has been focused on the ocean, the ocean world of Enceladus, a moon of one of the moons of Saturn. And so I'm going to hand it over to Nicole. And she's going to tell you about the machine learning projects. All right, can everybody hear me? Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Allen, for that introduction. So the things that I would like to talk about kind of in my portion of the talk for, for the rest of our time here are a few different themes that have come up in my, in my projects that I've been putting together my PhD thesis with. So kind of the different themes from a chemical standpoint that we're looking at is we want to look at both salts and ions as well as this ocean complexivity that we were kind of alluding to earlier where we look at these ocean systems, both terrestrial and beyond. But from a machine learning standpoint, we're very much looking at data-driven models in which we're kind of approaching our data sets from two different ways. We want to look at how do we analyze data sets when the data has already been taken and you're kind of you're held to these restrictions of how that initial data was collected. Um, there's not really anything that you can do to change that. Or, and on the other hand, we also want to look at using spectroscopic methods to generate our own data sets. Like if you have control over all the parameters of the data that you're taking, 
Well, well, how would you adjust it in order to make sure that you get the most bang for your buck in terms of your data? I'm gonna keep hitting the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> so, so for the first theme of this project, we're really looking at data that we were able to collect from the NIST webbook. That's the National Institute of Standards and Technology for the United States. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at automating functional group detection. And th throughout the rest of this section, I will be talking about de de detecting and identifying these functional groups. However, one of the things that we kind of want to stress is the fact that th this could be any kind of chemical characteristic that you have the ability to identify and label within your data. Functional groups was just an easy way for us to kind of get that process started, look at things with a bunch of chemical diversity. They're gonna have different fingerprints, both in mass spectra and in the vibrational spectroscopy. <coughs> and so when we look at the web scrape data that we were able to collect, we were able to collect just shy of 9,000 IR spectra. Um, and then on the other hand, we were able to collect over 20,000 mass spectra, all from the same website. Um, so, so these are pretty, pretty typical sizes when we think about as a whole data set for machine learning approaches. However, one of the things I wanna stress is the fact that if we look at each of these pie charts, both, um, both in the rings on the left and in the um, pie charts on the right, we, we see a large difference in how many representatives we have for each of our different functional groups. So what we're gonna see later is, we'll, we'll see if there's an effect showing if you have 100 data points or if you have a couple thousand data points, how is that gonna affect your accuracy? How does that help you describe the chemical complexivity? And one of the other things I wanna talk about in terms of the mass spectrometry project, we wanted to not only look at individual functional groups to get a metric of the specificity of this approach, its ability to really hone in on the spectroscopic signature of a single functional group, we also wanted to look at how generalized this can be. So beyond looking at single functional groups, we have these generalized classifications, which I will talk about a few different times. These are going to be A-containing or aromatic. This will be anything with an aromatic ring of various sizes. Um, we also have O-containing. These are going to be any functional group that contains an oxygen. And we also have nitrogen-containing. Again, this is any functional group that contains a nitrogen. Our reasoning behind this is because we not only wanted to look at how we do with specific functional groups, we wanted to know if we start making these higher level classes of these systems, do, do our models rely too heavily on certain representatives within that class or can we still get decent generalized models? So after we were able to do our web scraping, we really worked with this data in tandem until we get to the machine learning step, which I'll talk about here in a minute. So after our web sca scraping process, we were then able to, for, the, for the, our beginning analyses, we were able to make two-dimensional plots of each of these um, different types of spectra. And then we were able to label them using the Inchi keys. Uh, these are very similar to the things that we've been talking about the past few days with smiles. They're basically strings that contain the information as to what molecule or what atoms and what orientation are those made up within that molecule. From doing that, we were able to determine um, smaller substrings to then identify functional groups and label all of our cast numbers that we were using to, um, to, to organize our data so that way we could determine for each of these molecules which functional groups does it have and which does it not. We then went ahead and we organized all of our data into different folders. We wanted each of the, each of the data points, each of the spectra, either the IR or the mass spectra, to be separated into the folders of the functional groups that the molecule did contain and then differently labeled folders for the functional groups that it did not contain. And so from doing this, we were able to create large data sets that we are then going to look at individual models looking at one functional group and one functional group classification at a time. So when we pivoted and when we started looking at this, originally the goal was to use transfer learning. The reason that we did this was because you can, you can really save a lot of computational expense and you can have a higher level model with less computational resources with this transfer learning. This entire process had been done by transfer learning on Inception version three, which was originally trained on the ImageNet database with relatively good results. So what we did is we fixed most of those nodes, we retrained the last layer on our data to see how it would do. So this is our results from our IR study. Um, we, we see pretty good success here. Um, if we look at the graphs on the left, we actually see, so if you look at the x-axis, that's showing us for each of our different functional groups, they're organized by the number of representatives that we had for that specific functional group. Um, and as we see here, if we look from left to right, there really was no trend in terms of the number of, of, of representatives that we had for each functional group. 
This is kind of interesting, but it actually kind of pulls out some of this chemical um, complexity. There's more variation when we look at functional group to functional group. They're all gonna have their own different signatures. And those signatures ability to be described through these processes proves to be more important than the number of representatives that we have at this scale. And so we actually had a few different functional group classifications that we were able to get 100% um, accuracy on our final withheld test data. And so the, the unfortunate part about this was we tried this exact same process with the mass spectra and it, it, was, it went very poorly. We only had two models that performed similarly well out of 20. So the question became, as we pivoted away from that, why did this process work well with the IR-based data and why did it work so poorly with the mass spec-based data? What we're able to determine is the fact that when we look at IR data, we're looking at vibrations. We're looking at how that molecule is responding within space and how it responds to that light and in response of its bond vibrations. Now these bond vibrations are really sensitive to environment. If you have other, other species in solution or if you have a different phase, these peaks can actually shift um, both left and right up to tens of wave numbers. And during this process of the convolutional neural network, we actually see that um, through those convolutions, we think that it actually makes it less sensitive to these peaks shifting due to the fact that even if they're shifting tens of wave numbers, these peaks tend to generate in the same areas or at least regions of the spectra. And so when we compare this to mass spectra, uh, the difference becomes clear. We are looking at mass fragments. And if you look at adjacent mass fragments, those don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. There's isotopic features that are going to show up in there, but those fragments, um, them being next to each other doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to point to the exact same portion of that molecule. So I think what we're actually seeing in when we're to doing the convolutions on the mass spectra, we're actually artificially reducing our resolution, which if you're already working with unit resolution mass spectra, that, that, that's something you can't afford to lose. So we think that this actually might be the chemical reason as to why that this was unsuccessful in this case. So we wanted to pivot and we wanted to know if we wanted to look at mass spectra, how would we do so in a way that would be more successful? So we actually went ahead and we skirted all the way to the other end of the computational complexity scale. If we're looking at neural networks over on one side, logistic regression is really, really simple in comparison. So what we wanted to do is we, we shifted our focus from just identifying functional groups to also identifying where that inferring power comes from in our model. So not only did we wanna have accurate answers to whatever question we happen to be asking about whatever chemical analyte, we also wanted to understand the interpretation. And so we, we did this through logistic regression. And so when we compare the results that we had with our um, retraining of the convolutional neural network, we, we, we see a much higher accuracy in terms of logistic regression. <coughs> But at the same time, we see some similar trends, kind of what we've alluded to with the IR-based data. If we look on the left, this scatter plot is showing us our final um, testing valid, our, our final testing and training accuracies. And if we compare between them, if for example, if we compare the final training accuracy of our nitrile and our ketone all the way on the right, we are actually going to see a difference between those of over 7%. We wanted to compare this to what happens if you increase your mass range. What if you just give the model more data? Does that lead to increased accuracy? We, we see that the effects of increasing our mass range from 300 to 500 mass units only really leads to a difference of 3%, and sometimes that's actually a decrease in accuracy. We think that this likely stems from the fact that simply adding more masses doesn't necessarily mean that you're adding more chemical information. If you have small molecules, going from 300 to 500 mass units is meaningless if you had a small molecule that was already, its, its parent peak was at 100 mass units. And so, from this accuracy and kind of looking at how these models performed, we then wanted to understand, well, it's not only enough to know what the model thinks that the answer is, we also need to know how did it get there. So we decided to try this kind of feature analysis. And the idea for this process actually came from our understanding of convolutional neural networks and neural networks in general. There's a concept um, where you can actually do dropout nodes and the whole goal of that is to be able to randomly turn nodes on and off to ensure that your model is not relying too heavily on a single node in your network. Um, this kind of makes sure that, you're, that you're, if you have so many nodes and you have a high level of computational complexity, you're using all of it because you're training all of it. So the question became, if you have something really simple, for example, a logistic regression model, how can we do a similar knockout and make sure that no one piece of the puzzle is dominating the entire system? 
So we chose to do this by analyzing all the features. We actually turned the features off and on for retraining these spectra. So if we look here, our, in our step one, we train on all the available data. In this case, we did um, one to 300 M over Z. And then what we did is we retrained that same model 300 more times. And each time we would remove a single mass unit. And so the goal here is that we would turn off and turn on these different features. And then we would compare the final accuracies of that model to the model that had been trained on all the data. And so in doing so, we were able to kind of come up with a few different metrics in, in terms of this delta accuracy. So this is gonna be, this feels a little counterintuitive, but it'll make sense here in a moment. When we're looking at this delta accuracy, if we're seeing a negative delta accuracy, AKA if we're removing a mass and we see a large hit to the accuracy in that data, we have information to suggest that that mass was important for that um, model to be able to identify that functional group. The inverse is true if we see a positive um, delta A, if, if removing that mass actually increases the accuracy, we have suggestions that that, might, that peak might actually be hindering the model or making it more difficult for it to analyze. And so from doing this, we're able to kind of create a chemical fingerprint of how are these models making their assumptions. And we can actually look at this in terms of our generalized functional group classifications. So over here on the right, we have our A-containing, which again is our aromatics, our N-containing, nitrogen-containing functional groups, and our O-containing, oxygen-containing functional groups. If we look at that second column, that is the mass value that was the most impactful for that model to be able to make its assignment. If we look at the nitrogen-containing, for example, if we look at those values, the majority of them are odd. This actually kind of correlates with what we normally consider in mass spectrometry, the odd nitrogen rule. Due to the fact that nitrogen has a, a, a molecular weight, or, uh, excuse me, an atomic weight of 15, if you have an odd number of nitrogens, it's common to see odd numbered peaks in your spectra because those odd, those odd mass nitrogens will show up in those fragments. Um, and so the fact that all of those important peaks turn out to be odd is really important for us understanding how, it, it's, it's almost like re, relearning that rule without having been explicitly told. The other thing that we can look at is when we look at the aromatic containing functional groups, we, we see that if we're looking at 78, that we think that that correlates with benzene, which for the NIST database would make sense for that being the most common aromatic ring that you're going to see. And so not only are we able to get these answers to our models, we are also able to get information as to where that inferring power comes from. And so the question that is like, where do we go from here? Like we were saying earlier, if we're looking at these classification type approaches, you could be using this to look at different kinds of analytes. However, going back to our main AI goal for our lab, we want to be able to use these simple spectroscopic techniques to describe complex chemical systems. And so in doing that, we're hoping to move for a more regression type learning approach. So th this is actually from a preprint that we've written. We want to start looking at um, snapshots of the chemistry of the ocean. We want to be able to take simple vibrational spectroscopy and use that to be able to get relative ratios of some different classifications of molecules. In this case, we're going to be looking at lipid um, sugars and protein. We have, a, we have this preliminary study where we're looking at, we're able to correctly identify within 10% absolute concentrations of different kinds of sugars in the same solution. And then we're able to get that down to, um, so we're able to take multiple sugars at the same time, but wind up with a concentration within 10% accuracy. So we're now hoping to expand this to look at multiple species at the same time. So that way we'll be able to, uh, hopefully be able to take vibrational spectroscopy and use that to get really detailed information about the health of our ocean. Because um, these ratios could easily be shifted by things like oil spills or if you have an algal bloom. And it would be a really interesting way to kind of get uh, qu quick and easy sensing metrics of a large complex chemical system. And with that, we would like to thank everybody who's helped us with this project, um, including all of our different funding sources. And Dr. Allen and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've got time for a question or two, if there uh, are any. Ah, one question. Okay, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, just at the end, you talk about using these methods for sensing maybe oil leaks or whatnot. Uh, but the initial uh, methods you described are looking just at the surface, right? So you come at the surface, maybe just the top few millimeters, right? You can't penetrate. So if this sort of mixing is not represented in the in that top surface, then I guess it's difficult to see, right? Well, the sensors, first of all, you can collect 
the sea surface microlayer through, in fact, we've done this just recently, we went to Florida, and through um, dipping of hydrophobic um, and hydrophilic plates, and you can actually peel off the sea surface microlayers, and that's done. And, and um, the sensing techniques can be done on those solutions. So, so they can be applied both to sea surface as well as... Our, our Florida data is actually in this graph. I didn't have a chance to go into it in full detail. But these samples over here were surface samples, like Dr. Allen was saying, that we've collected. And then we went ahead and we, we used this model to determine um, the concentrations. And these match up relatively well with literature values of the expected amount of sugar in those samples. So, so future work on that, too, is to couple those same samples to the high-level lab-based mass spectrometry to get the actual ratios, other than right now we're just comparing to literature. So we're collaborating with a group to do that, too. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Uh, right, we've got time for one more. Hi. Yep. Oh, um, thank you, Professor Allen and Nicole, for a great talk. Um, so you talked about um, your interest in um, turning it to a regression problem. So have you tried um, doing regression on the same problem um, to, to get the percentages of functional groups? And if not, what challenges do you foresee in, in doing that? I was going to say, that's something that we haven't tried yet that would be interesting. Um, actually, the, 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 the number, so the number of functional groups that each molecule has or looking at the different, um, uh, looking at how many of them, like, for example, how many alcohols it has, that is information that we have access to in our labels, and that would be something that we could try. Um, that actually kind of came, th that idea kind of came up when we thought, originally thought about this. The initial thought was looking at one model that would be able to look at all the functional groups at once and maybe give you a statistical likelihood that that functional group is within the molecule. I think what we ran into with that is the fact that when we try to do that kind of regression-based approach with our current data is the data disparity in how many representatives we had for each functional group. If, if there would be a lot of functional groups that I feel like would never actually get selected by that model due to the fact that we had 2,000 of this one and we only had like 43, for example, of like acyl halides. And so I, I wasn't sure of a way to better scale that data in order to make sure that we weren't just accidentally kicking out a likelihood that that functional group showed up in the NIST database as opposed to in that molecule specifically. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with that, should we thank our speaker again, please?